mailbag. Nothing personal. Word of the day is mailbag. We got another one for you. So many great questions that we're doing some extra mailbags while I'm away. Indisposed, predisposed, predetermined, premedicated, pre-med, post-law. You've asked questions on Twitter. You've gone and you've rated and reviewed on Apple. We thank you for that. Truly, we do. You've told your friends about nothing personal. Let's get right into some questions. And I want to start this one with a great start. This could be the best start to any question we've had, Coca. Here we go. I'm curious, how many questions from people you don't get to? I've asked questions here and on Apple Podcast after rating five stars and leaving a comment, but nothing. I'm sure you're getting a lot of questions and are very busy. One, what percentage of questions do you actually answer on the podcast and how much everywhere else? Let me start with one. So I had never been on social media. The first time I went on Twitter and opened an account was the same night. I opened a Twitter, a Facebook, and an Instagram. And it was the day of the first game of the 2017 World Series. Let me bring you back to October 2nd was my last day in baseball. I said goodbye to Derek. And Derek did not say goodbye to me. I walked out of the office, went home and said, NW. Now what? Started thinking about what would be next. I never really thought about what was next, even while negotiating for the ball, for the, for the ballpark. That's funny. While negotiating to sell the team on behalf of the owner, I knew that I would not continue working as president of the Marlins. I wasn't sure how long Jeter would keep me on because I had a few years left on my contract. So I figured he may keep me on for a couple of months just so I can introduce him to a few ghosts and show him a few closets in the ballpark and where we keep things and how to do things, but it wasn't to be. So I got a text message saying that I was gone and the deal closed. I walked out. True story. I was walking out while Derek was walking in, didn't wave, didn't do anything. And then the Jeter era started. So the rest of the month goes by and I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I figure, hey, let's see if I can get anyone to pay me to talk because that's something I've been doing my whole life, talking. When I was young, I got paid not to talk by my mother and father. It was great. But now I wanted to get paid to talk. So a couple of weeks later, the World Series is starting and it's the first World Series in 18 years that I was not a part of. I don't mean as a participant, that was only one World Series, but in the industry. So I'm sitting there, the game is ready to start. And I said, you know what? I guess I got to start doing social media because when I was with the Marlins, my mouth got me in enough trouble as it is, but I certainly was not going to be on Twitter or Instagram or doing anything like that because I figured there's a chance that would violate certain provisions of my contract, like non-disparagement and best interests of the team and don't do anything to make yourself look like a jackass. And I learned that on Twitter and on various other platforms, that is a likely possibility. Even if you don't want to, sometimes it just happens because you can't please everyone every time. Most times you please some people, some of the times there are people who please no one all the time or no one, none of the time. No, there's no one who does that because that means you're pleasing everyone all the time. There once was a story about everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. Everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody did it. That's a good poem. Anyway, let me get back. So I joined Twitter and I figure out how to do it and I'm whatever. And some followers come and I'm watching the World Series. And I kept an option, which was DMs. I didn't know what those were. And the option was DMs open, closed. And I didn't know I was going to make it a public account. And all of a sudden, I start getting some DMs. And then cut to a few months later, I start with CBS, yada, yada. I start with CBS, yada, yada, nothing personal starts, yada, yada. I get a lot of DMs with people asking questions because yada, yada, there is a segment in nothing personal called So You Want to Talk to Samson? Because if you think I'm not going to work a movie into the show or a review of movies or the movie half-baked into the show, then you don't know me very well. It's funny now people know me very well because you listen and I appreciate that. But as time has passed and the show has gotten bigger, I'm getting more and more questions. I used to be able to respond to every single DM. And I've got anxiety about this right now because I couldn't really 
go to sleep without having read or without having responded to as many as possible. And eventually I would get to almost all of them, get that eventually almost all of them. But at least I would get rid of the red number on the Twitter app pin that is on my phone. And then after my sister passed away last week, the condolences came quickly and in great numbers, which was incredibly meaningful to say the least and touching to say the mid and overwhelming to say the most. And I don't know how I'm going to get through all of them and contained within them. There's, there's some questions and mixed in. There's some questions. And the first day I fell behind, I, I couldn't sleep. And then the second day I was a little more behind and I couldn't look at the phone because I was busy all day doing things and and getting ready for a funeral and everything else that had to be done, logistically speaking, because I'm the logistics man. And now I'm so behind that it gets me worried that I'll never catch up. And if I don't catch up, it just means I'm sorry. It doesn't mean that I won't read it because I am reading every one of them. I will not be able to respond to all. So the question is, what percentage of questions that I get do I actually answer? And it's it started off as you know, 80%, it went down to 70, 60, 50, 40. It's just math, right? There's only five shows a week and we don't take many days off. We do one show, a sh one question a show, but as the more questions come, the percentage is down and my percentage is now in single digits, unfortunately. And I feel terribly about that. I'm happy we're getting to these mailbags. Coco wanted me to send a tweet to get more questions. So now there's even more questions that are not gonna get answered, but we're gonna try as many as we can, but I wanted to get to yours too. Today's pod, I don't know which pod this day was, it could be from a year ago, had interesting commentary on political donations. Don't get me started on those. Remember at the end of the uh, uh, January 6th, what was it? What are we calling it? The insurrection? And all these companies said that we are not going to give money anymore to any politicians who are not recognizing this as an insurrection, any politicians who were sort of taking part in this or wallowing in the glow of trying to overthrow the government or whatever was going on on January 6th, whatever it was, is something that should never go on. And these companies came out and said, we are not going to participate. And I told you on the pod, horse hockey, of course, they're going to participate. They're just going to wait for it to blow over. And lo and behold, here we are six months later, eight months later, I can't remember how many months later, January 6th to August 6th is one to eight, seven months later, plus a week or so. And these companies are back giving to both sides of the aisle because it's business and political donations by companies are done for business purposes only. They are not issue related. They give to both sides of the aisle because they need everybody. It made me think of back to the question, Bush, well, I'm not sure why, but hey, whatever flips your lid. It made me think of Bush. How good of a, it's really just how good a, how you don't need of. How good a baseball exec was he? And how much do you think Major League Baseball had to do with him getting elected president? We're talking about George Bush, George W. Bush, the son of President George H.W. Bush. Now I'm worried that I have them confused. I think George W. Bush is the son. Thank you. Jeb Bush's brother. Jeb Bush is the, was the governor of Florida, had many dealings with Jeb Bush. I met George Bush because he owned the Texas Rangers when Jeffrey Luria owned the Oklahoma City 89ers. The Oklahoma City 89ers hosted an exhibition game. I was in law school at the time. I just went up for the game down, actually, from New York to Oklahoma City. And as the owner of the Rangers, George Bush was there. He was the either the governor or the former governor of the state of Texas. I got to say hello to him and we spent some time together, which is why when he became president and I was with the Marlins, we when we see each other, he would know me, which was cool. I admit it. When a president knows you, it just feels different when you're in a room, much different than a movie star or with a celebrity or with an athlete. When you're in a room with the president of the United States, no matter your view of the politics, it just feels like there is an aura of gravitas, at least it used to, an aura of gravitas when you're in a room. And I would go to the tarmac and meet him when he'd fly in to Miami in 2003. We went to the White House after we won the World Series and spent time with him. And uh, it was terrific. But once he was done with the Rangers, he sold the team because he was part of a big group and he made a fortune. His initial investment into the Rangers versus what he got out of it was probably the best investment of the Bush family in terms of return on investment. And he found a way he was at one point considered 
spoiler alert, a front runner to be the commissioner of baseball. There was a thought that he'd be the one to replace Bud and that there'd be an opportunity when Bud was interim for so long. And even when Bud started getting terms, we weren't sure how long Bud wanted to do it because he did miss ownership of the Brewers. He eventually sold the Brewers to Mark Antanasio. But there was always the thought that George would be commissioner because he had this amazing way about him, both as an owner and as a president, actually. He had the ability to build consensus. And it was my belief when I got into baseball that building consensus was the single most important thing a commissioner could do. It turns out that some commissioners rule with a heavy hand. Some commissioners like building by consensus. Some commissioners are far more interested in getting certain issues done with labor, some are issues with marketing, some want attendance, some want good PR. All commissioners are different. But George Bush, we always thought would have made a good commissioner. When he was running for president, it was an interesting time because I'm trying to remember what year he was president. I want to say 00 to 08. Is there any chance that's right, Coca? Because what well, wasn't Clinton 92 to 2000? And then Bush 00 to 08. I could be wrong. I can't. I still get confused, like working backwards in terms of who's president when. So he get, gets elected in 00 and he takes office in January of 01, which was my second season in baseball. But the election was my first year in baseball. And there was a lot of talk in owners meetings, the fact that George Bush was running for president and the fact that we'd want him to win. And the reason we wanted him to win is everyone in that room had a relationship with him. And it wasn't a forced relationship. It was a, a congenial relationship. It was one that we thought we would be able to have some influence in, in Washington. It was one where we thought where we always have to protect our antitrust exemption. We're always trying to get certain things passed in different states. We're always trying to give money to both sides of the aisle. We're always trying to make sure that uh, we are participating in our democracy. That was the word I liked using. Throwing money around, I didn't like using that. Trying to wield influence, a heavy stick, I didn't like using that. I like to say, we want to participate in the democracy. Some people participate by voting. Some people participate by voting and then stepping it up by having relationships with their local Congress people, their state senators. Some people can participate in the democracy from the school board level up to the United States senator, up to the cabinet and the presidency. And if you have a good relationship with the president, that's going to help you. It sounds terrible. It sounds as though that we have a democracy where juice matters. Shocking. Am I upsetting anyone? that the more connections you have, the better off you are, no matter what industry you're in, no matter what job you have, connections matter. And I embrace it. I think there's a question coming up in one of these mailbags, or maybe it's today, or maybe it's another day, or maybe it's never, about my view of nepotism and my view of family businesses, my view of having connections for people who you're not related to, people you don't work with, but having connections to them and being able to ask a favor and being able to do a favor. That stuff matters. Take it down to your, uh, your world, your business, your family, your life. How often do you say to yourself, man, I wish I knew that person because I need something. And how many people look at you with what you can provide and feel as though they can't access you when they need something you can offer? So the bigger your Rolodex is, that's an old person's term for your contacts, the bigger number of contacts you have, the better. And that's why meeting people and being gregarious and finding touch points for people, it matters. So we wanted to get George Bush elected and we raised money and we tried and we canvassed and we politicked and we got people out to vote. And when he was elected president, I remember very clearly being very happy because I knew that that would be beneficial to the sport of baseball. And I wasn't wrong, actually. But if you ask the specific question of how much should MLB have to do with him getting elected president, I would not for one second have the ego, and my ego is healthy. I would not for one second say that we as an industry were instrumental in his election. No, I would not say that. What I would say is thank you, Chad. Next. Your honest and lack of filter are refreshing. Thank you. That is what nothing personal is. That's our whole show. Anyway, 
Can you discuss how to enjoy distance running and how to properly breathe while doing it? I wanted to put this in the show and do a, a couple of questions here about running. People come up to me and ask about the different things that I've done uh, for charity and just because I wanted to. My marathon career started in 1996 when someone bet me and my friend Brett that we couldn't run the New York Marathon that November. And we went to the uh, uh, the reservoir in New York City, was living in New York at the time, was working in Europe at the company I, I started called News Travels Fast. We went to the 1.4 mile reservoir and we could not make it around the reservoir. We were huffing and puffing and gagging and wheezing and coughing up a lung. And we were trying to figure out how are we gonna do this? So we found a guy named Hal Higdon, who is halhigdon.com. And we started following his training program and we did not miss a training run. And March of 1996, I ran my first marathon. And that was the beginning of a long-term love affair that is going on to this day, where I'm currently training for Boston in October, New York in November, and then a hundred mile run, which I've never done in December. So I've done marathons and ultra marathons. I've done some fifties and, uh, I love the ability to raise money for charity. And as you've heard me say, to do things that everyone can do, but most people choose not to. That's important for all of my pursuits because I have no great skills. I don't have height. I don't have weight. I don't have <clears throat> hand-eye coordination. Although, although I can hit a baseball, which is shocking because I can't see out of my left eye because my mother wouldn't put a patch on my right eye when I was young. I'm just kidding, mom. I don't blame everything on you, I promise. But I did find out that if I had put a patch on my right eye, my left eye would work. And right now I'm, I'm closing my right eye and looking at my left eye. I would not be able to recognize anyone unless they spoke. And then if I knew you, I would recognize you. But I can still hit a tennis ball and a baseball. But running and, and things like that, anybody can do, right? Ironman, bike riding. And so you're asking me, how do you enjoy distance running? The first thing I would tell you is this, you have to be disciplined. Discipline is something that crosses all. What's the word, Coca? Come on. Ram it. It crosses all disciplines. Work, family, personal life, professional life, athletic endeavors. Discipline is the concept of remembering tomorrow. Remembering tomorrow is the concept that if you don't do today what you're supposed to do today and you wake up tomorrow, you look back at yesterday and say, man, I should have done it, but I didn't. And now I have to do it today. And it may be a day late and a dollar short. The discipline is knowing and remembering that tomorrow, how you'd feel if you do today what you're supposed to do today. You've got a five mile run, do it. I had a seven mile run to do this morning. True story. I went out, did the seven very early because I remember tomorrow and I wanted to look back on today and know that I did my day of training. And I lean in to that discipline and I let it be pervasive throughout the rest of my life, sometimes to my detriment, might I add, because when discipline can sometimes lead to lack of flexibility, discipline can sometimes lead to certain OCD tendencies. And I don't wanna label things and I don't wanna say that I have OCD when I may or may not, but I do know that I like things done a certain way, although that could be control. I do know that I like the idea of having a plan and sticking to it. I do know that when people are late, it makes me crazy because I'm not late. I do know that I feel better about myself. That's the whole thing with numbers on the phone, right? I don't like notes that say alerts, five unread emails, let's say. And when people show me 10,882 unread emails and 175 unlistened to phone messages and 820 unread text messages, I can't function that way. I can't function going to bed with dishes in the sink. I can't function going to bed with clothes on the floor. I just can't. My brain won't stop. Now you'll say to yourself, but you don't sleep, Samson, and you're right. So maybe it's not enough. Maybe the juice isn't worth the squeeze and maybe... I should change completely and keep the house a mess, keep dishes around, not worry about laundry or cleanliness or doing things I'm supposed to do when I'm supposed to do them, because then I'll sleep like a baby, which I already do. I'm up every hour crying. So to, to enjoy distance running, you have to be a little bit Alexis. You have to be a little bit understanding the difference between being injured and being hurt. 
You can run through being hurt. You can't run through being injured. You have to understand the pain that comes with pleasure versus the pain that comes with injury. You have to understand and recognize the endorphins that are released when you run and crave them and wait for them. And when you get them, enjoy them and then want them again and again. You have to understand that your body is way more capable than your head. You have to understand that your brain will make you quit long distance running far before your head will, far before. I was thinking back to the Ironman I did in, in Hawaii. Still the only active team president to the Hawaii Ironman. 15 hours and 36 minutes to swim 1.2 miles, 2.4 miles, excuse me, to bike 112 miles and then to run a marathon. I cried during the course of that. There's a video of it uh, that Al Troutwig narrated. And I will never forget doing the Ironman and finishing the bike as the winners were finishing the entire Ironman. And I couldn't believe I had a, a marathon left to run. And I broke down because I was pretty sure I wouldn't be able to finish in time. Because if you don't finish in 17 hours, you're not an Ironman. And all I wanted was the tattoo. I wanted to be an Ironman. I didn't care if I finished in 16 hours and 59 minutes and 59 seconds because you're an Ironman if you're under 17 and you're an Ironman for life. So the discipline of training, the discipline of taking one step, it leads to your body and mind never quitting at the same time. So my body quit many times during races over the years, but not at the same time as my mind. My mind would tell me I'm done, but my legs would keep going. And that's what training is. And during the course of, a, of an ultra marathon, your mind and body will break down several times. And so do you have the discipline not to listen to the person on your shoulder? The person on your shoulder is the one who says, stop, start walking. Don't go out the door. Don't run today. You'll do it tomorrow. You can eat that hostess cupcake. No problem. You'll start tomorrow. How many people say tomorrow? I'm going to change my eating habits tomorrow. I'm going to start working out tomorrow. I'm going to get rid of my belly tomorrow. The problem is that tomorrow never comes because tomorrow is always tomorrow. You have to put in your head that you're going to do it today because today is the only day you control. And if you put off till tomorrow, what you can do today, which I did in school, by the way, I was one of the great procrastinators of all time, which really has helped me in life because it gave me a great understanding of what I needed to do when I needed to do it in order to get done what I needed to do by a certain time. And I recognized doing long distance running that you cannot do a marathon if you don't do the training, you just can't do it. And if you're asking a specific question, I guess, about breathing, I don't have an answer for you. You're supposed to breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth. I don't do it. I breathe in and out through the mouth because my nose is always stuffed. You're supposed to run toe heel. I don't. I run heel toe. My answer is there is no supposed to. Just get out there and do it. Get a heart rate monitor. Keep your heart rate around 130 to 140. When it goes higher, slow down. When it goes below that, you can speed up a little bit. Have the discipline to remember tomorrow. And if you want a tip, the next question is, Coco, good job mixing these questions, putting them next to each other. Any tips for first-time marathon runners and or funny stories about newbie mistakes made while training for marathons? Oh, I've got some good ones. Do you ever shoot baskets as a kid? You know, when you're shooting baskets and there's like 10 of you at a basket and you're all shooting baskets and there's six balls and you wait under the hoop for a rebound and then you dribble out and take a shot. And if you make it, you get it, you get the ball again. It's called backseas, or if you make it, take it. How many of you, while under the basket, have gotten hit on the top of the head with a rebound? And because you're not looking at that ball, you're looking at that ball, and all of a sudden the ball hits the top of your head and you bite your tongue because the ball hits your head. That's the type of thing that you do once. It happens to everyone once because the next time you're rebounding under the basket, with 10 people shooting at the same basket, you're very cognizant of balls hitting your head and you're sort of protecting your tongue. It's like people touching hot things. I try to keep my kids away from touching the stove, but at the end of the day, if they'll just quickly touch it, they'll say, wow, I don't want to do that again. And that'll be it for the rest of their lives. So a lot of things in running are that way. You don't know what to do until you do it and say, I don't want to ever do that again. I finished a training run one day with a streak of red coming down from my nipples. I didn't know what it was. And it turned out that my nipples were bleeding from chafing. And I didn't think anything of it. 
I thought that was fine. I thought it was gross. There's no doubt about it. And then I went into the shower and I cried. I screamed bloody murder. When you've got chafing and you shower, you've got a problem. So you know what you do from then on? You wear Band-Aids or you put on A&D ointment around your testicles or under your arm or wherever it is that you chafe because chafing hurts more than you can believe. But you won't believe me until it happens to you. And if you start doing distance running, I promise you it's going to happen to you. But whatever, it'll happen and you'll move on. Another newbie mistake is with food. You have to learn your stomach. You cannot do what other people do. Some people eat gel, some people eat goo, some people eat syrup. Some people eat cookies. Some people can eat pizza or hamburgers. Some people can smoke and drink. You have to learn what your stomach can handle. And it is trial and error. And the error comes when you crap yourself. And if you are a distance runner, you are going to have to pull over on the side of the road and you're going to have to take a dump. It is a guarantee it's going to happen one time during your training. Some people carry toilet paper. I was more of a water bottle leaf guy. And you learn very quickly what to do and what not to do, but you can't follow other people's lead because everybody has a different stomach. You'll also learn a newbie mistake is people who start off too fast and talk too much. When you're doing your first marathon, you have this notion that you want to keep up with the wave of people. You want to talk to all the fans and spectators watching, and you spend so much energy that by mile 18, you can't move. You cannot move. But you got to learn to, they call it negative splits is the way to run a marathon. So your second half marathon is faster than your first half marathon. And that's what a marathon is, two halves. But it's very, very difficult to do because it takes a lot of discipline to go slower than you're supposed to go because so many people when they're running are in the now. Man, I feel great. I'm going. Here I go. I used to do that. And then when you bonk, bonk is the word for not finishing a race or a run. Bonking is when you're out too fast and you just can't finish. Bonking is when you're out and it gets hot and you're not hydrated enough. If you're thirsty while you're running, you've waited too long. If you're hungry while you're running, you've waited too long. If you finish a run and you look like Santa Claus, then you need a little more salt. Runners know what I'm talking about. There's people who run and when they're done, they've got salt all over the body, dried salt. It's, it's actually salt. If you lick your skin after a long run, you could brush it onto your fries and you'd be at Mickey D's. Other newbie mistakes are thinking that there are people caring about your time. Everybody says, hey, you did a marathon. That's great. What was your time? And I'll tell them my time. I used to be embarrassed. Four hours, 34 minutes. Four hours, 20 minutes. One time I did three hours, 57 minutes. Five hours and 22 minutes. And then I started realizing the people who were asking my time were not marathon runners. And it didn't matter. So sometimes I say two hours and one minute. And I'll say, oh, my God, that's so fast. Other times I'll say, yeah, it was about 12 hours, 42 minutes. I like seeing people's faces. You're running it for yourself. You are running it to feel good about doing something that so many people have never done and will never do. My advice to you, if you are a newbie and you want to train for a marathon, is to go online and get a training program. My advice is that you start today. Start today. Okay. Hi, David. Hi. I'm a Lebetard fan convert. You hear that, CBS? Love your lack of filter and fearlessness. Thank you. God, that seems to be a theme. Hmm. Can you explain how to start distance running, please? I was 310 pounds. Now I'm 180, but I still don't like running. How can I make it pleasurable and not punishment? I also appreciate your candidness on anxiety. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Congratulations on getting from 310 to 180. You are a person who remembered tomorrow. You said, I'm going to start now. If you don't like running, that's okay. Do you like walking? You must be doing some sort of activity to have lost 130 pounds. But people ask, how do I, why do I enjoy running? I enjoy running because I get all my work done while running. 
My brain works in such a way that I have music on in the background and I'm going through my schedule for that day. The next day, I'm thinking about shows with nothing personal. Every run I do, including the run today, I thought about this mailbag episode and certain concepts I wanted to get over, certain lists I wanted to make, certain points I wanted to make. And then I keep sort of track of it in my mind. And then I keep repeating it during the course of the run because I don't carry a phone. So I don't dictate it into a phone when I have a great idea because I test my brain by trying to remember every idea I have while I'm running. Some people choose podcasts like nothing personal to listen to. Hey, you want to go running? Get outside, put nothing personal on. You love the show. Don't stop either running or walking or jogging until I say it's just business. It's nothing personal. And let that be your workout for the day. Some people choose to listen to shows or albums. You want to listen to a show, you can listen to the full soundtrack of a movie or of a TV show or, or of a Broadway show and say, I'm going to keep moving until the show is over. Some people want to run with other people to have conversations. Some people want to run with other people to have company. Some people want to run alone. You have to find out what makes you go. And that is the same in your business, in your personal life. Stop worrying about what other people think, please. One of my great barometers of success is a complete lack of care about what anyone's ever thought of me. All the hate, the love, the, the emotion that has been headed my direction as an 18-year Major League Baseball president, it never got to me. And some people say you must be robotic. I was. Some people say you must have no feelings. Does that impact your personal life? It did. It does. Some people say, God, that must lead to anxiety. I say it does. But I still choose all of that before I choose letting people who I don't know, or even in some cases, people I do know, feel that they can criticize or tell me something about my job or my life when they are not in my shoes. That is a topic that should be in the front of your head as we get past 2020 and 2021. We don't know what it is to be in other people's shoes at all. You don't know what it is to be me and I don't know what it is to be you. What I try to do every day on Nothing Personal is give you insight into how I make decisions, the way I view the world, and then give you a lens through which you can view it. I don't choose for you what to think, what to believe. I want to give you the option. So running for me is pleasurable because I get to go through all of these things. I get a moment. Find your moment. You've already gotten yourself from 310 to 180. You already have the discipline. Now get your shoes on and get out the door. I don't care if you're speed walking or walking or schluffing. I just want you out the door. So how about this commitment to me? How about next week when you hear this? or yesterday when you've heard it, or whatever day you're listening to this, tomorrow's show, listen to it outside. How about that? Okay, I wanna get to uh, another question. Someone said to me, can you name the top five moments in movies that made your jaw drop? Yes, I can. Top five moments in movies that made your jaw drop. Number five, I've thought about this list actually, and I did prepare this. This is not off the top of my head. Top five, there was a movie, I don't remember what year, but it's got to be in the 90s called The Crying Game. The Crying Game stars Jay Davidson and Stephen Ray. It is about, also Forrest Whitaker, by the way, it is about the IRA and a kidnapping and a killing and how somebody feels guilty about killing somebody and tries to make up and ends up falling in love with the significant other of a person who he killed. And spoiler alert, at the end of the movie, the man is in love with a woman played by Jay Davidson, but it turns out there's a nude scene and Jay Davidson is a man because you see his penis. At the same time, Stephen Ray sees his penis and all of a sudden there's a situation. Now this is back in 1992, you know, 20 years later, God, it's 30 years later. Holy cow, 29 years later, all the issues with transgender, all the he, she, they, and all, all the people who are far more accepting. Remember back in the day when Danny Bonaducci had a transvestite hooker or something, 
and everyone was so critical of it. I don't think they were critical of the hooker part. They were critical of the transvestite part. I think tolerance levels have gone up. But this movie, when that happened, my jaw dropped to the floor because I thought she was beautiful. And it turns out she was a he. So it turns out it doesn't matter what's south of the border. It just matters whether or not you love the person and are attracted to the person. Number four, and this was 1999, my mind got completely blown with number four. The movie's Fight Club, and I'm going to spoil it because if you haven't seen it, then I don't know what you're doing. Fight Club with Edward Norton and Edward Norton. When I realized it was Edward Norton and Edward Norton, and I'm watching the scene of the fight in the garage, I, I didn't even know what to do, except I smiled. I remember I watched that movie with Larry Beinfest at his house in Montreal in the year 2000, uh, after a game, late at night when the snow was falling, and that movie blew my socks off. Number three, 2014, this is one of Coca's favorite movies. There's a movie with Tom Cruise, who I love, you know that, called Edge of Tomorrow. When I first realized what the story was of Edge of Tomorrow and the fact that he had to keep going through every day and there was no tomorrow, I, I couldn't believe it. I didn't see that coming. That's the third biggest jaw drop I've had. The second biggest jaw drop was in 2001, one of my top 10 movies. And it wasn't a moment. I put this at number two. There's a musical called Moulin Rouge. And you may hear that name twice in this show. But Moulin Rouge was a movie that I loved every song. I loved Ewan McGregor and Nicole Kidman and John Leguizamo playing Toulouse Lautrec. Just there, there wasn't one part of that movie I didn't love. I remember seeing it at a theater. I was sitting in the movie theater. It's a Baz Luhrmann production. And during the course of that movie, I said to myself, this Baz Luhrmann is doing something that is impacting me that I will never forget. I was so thankful to him for making that movie. I was so thankful to Nicole Kimmon and Ewan McGregor. I listened to the soundtrack while running still to this day. To this day, Jim Broadbent was so good in that movie playing Siddler. The, the genius of the writing. When you watch Moulin Rouge and pay attention to the screenplay and realize that every line in the beginning has to do with a line in the end, every song is telling the story of something that's going to happen. Come what may, Moulin Rouge number two. And number one, there will never be, never, never say never. Well, it's been 26 years, and this has been my number one since the moment I saw it. It's a movie with Stephen Baldwin, Benicio Del Toro, Gabriel Byrne, Kevin Spacey, Pete Postlewaite. Do you know the movie yet? It's called the Usual Suspects. The end of The Usual Suspects, which is the story of Kaiser Soze. And the question is, who is Kaiser Soze? And when you realize who Kaiser Soze is, and I'm not spoiling this one, but when you see the facts come through, and then you see what is the name of the FBI questioner, Chaz Palmentieri is his name. When you see him drop his coffee mug, it is the single greatest jaw drop in the history of cinema, and that is the fact. Someone else asked me a question, and we're doing lists right now. What are the top 10 Broadway shows you've ever attended? I want to do a call out to Broadway because Broadway's starting again. I miss Broadway. I love it. When I was living in Florida, I would go to shows at convention centers, at uh, not convention centers, at uh, cultural centers, at performing arts centers. I would go down to the Arsh Center in Miami. I would go to the Broward uh, Performing Arts Center in Broward. I would go up to Palm Beach. I've always been lucky enough that I had an opportunity to go to Broadway. I'd wait online at TKTS when I was young, which is something that no one would remember, but that's how you used to get Broadway shows. You could buy, buy tickets the day of the show. I was always in awe. I was in some plays in high school. I continued to be in some plays after high school. And I was just in awe of what it is to be live every single night and the feeling of the epiphany I had wondering how actors don't get bored doing the same thing night after night. 
and then doing a play myself and realizing, wow, not no two shows are ever the same. You go see a show and you may think it's the same, but to the actors, there is a different feeling. There's different lines that are missed. There's different cues that are missed. There's just things that happen during the course of a show, technical, technical errors, whatever the case is, it's never the same. So I've loved Broadway shows. I love Broadway musicals. I embrace that fact. I sing Broadway musicals. I'm a show tune guy. I sing show tunes. I listen to show tunes. My music while I run is a lot of show tunes. So top 10. Number 10, Springsteen on Broadway. I don't like Springsteen alone as much as I do when he's with the E Street Band with 60,000 people. That's number one. When he's with 20,000 people in arena, that's number two. When he's alone in arena, that's number three. On Broadway, he's alone in a very small atmosphere. It's very impactful. And when you have a love of Bruce, as I do, forget politically, I'm talking about his music, I'm talking about his passion, I'm talking about the fact that it's 70 years old, he keeps going like the Energizer Bunny, forgetting what substances he's on, it doesn't matter to me. I just want to feel the way I feel when I listen to him live. Number nine, they made Moulin Rouge a musical. I went to see it on Broadway and it was outstanding. Usually I would say nothing could beat the movie because it's in my top 10, but Moulin Rouge is the ninth best Broadway show I've seen ever. And I've seen a lot. I'm giving you a top 10, but I've seen scores and scores of plays and musicals. Number eight, an oldie but a goodie, The Lion King. Lion King was higher up on the chart when I was younger. It is unreal what they do up and down the aisle with the animal puppets. It is so interesting. You should take your kids if you can. If you have a chance to see a show, go see Lion King. I put Cats above it at number six because when I went to the Winter Garden Theater the first time to see Cats, I couldn't believe how much I enjoyed the music. I couldn't believe how interested I was in people dressing as cats, singing songs and crawling around the stage. Forget the movie based on the play. The movie was absolute horse hockey crap. Terrible. I'm sorry, Jimmy Corden. I love you, man. But that was so bad. But the play, the musical, I always wanted to be a Jellicle cat. I wouldn't have minded being Mr. Mistopheles, but Jellicle cats, that's where my head was. Number six, Rent. Rent is a soundtrack from start to finish that is one of the top maybe two or three soundtracks of all time. It, is, it takes place in AIDS-infested New York back in the 80s and 90s when people were dying of AIDS all the time. And uh, now, thankfully, people are not dying as much here in the U.S., though AIDS is still a big issue in other continents. And Jonathan Larson wrote this musical about life in the village. And it was the opposite of any life I had led. I was an Upper East Side guy. I had no understanding of what was going on. Of course, I knew about Studio 54. I knew about AIDS. I had actually lost a friend in high school to AIDS. A beautiful, beautiful soul named Allison Gertz was two years ahead of me. I had the biggest crush on her and she thought I was cute and she would let me hang out with her friends and her. And she unfortunately died of AIDS way, way, way too young. I still think about you every day, Ali, actually. She was on the cover of People magazine after she passed away because at that time, you had to be gay to have AIDS is what everyone was told, but it turns out that you don't have to be. And that stays true to this day. Rent. I went to Cardoza Law School. Number five is a musical that was written by people who went to Cardoza. It's called Avenue Q. Avenue Q is an adult puppet show. It is adult, adult, adult. If you haven't listened to the song Schadenfreude, how do you, what do I do with my BA in English? The internet is for porn. Do you know that uh, when my son was eight, he and his friend were in my car and I was listening to my music because with my kids, maybe they like 80s music now, maybe they like show tunes, maybe they don't, but I was not gonna be listening to Barney while I was driving. I would listen to my music, call me selfish, that's okay, I like my music. And I was listening to the Avenue Q soundtrack and on comes the song, The Internet is for Porn. And I hear giggling in the backseat and I had no idea. I just didn't realize that they were too young to be listening to that song and they still have that memory. So you're welcome, Michael, and you're welcome, Caleb, because the internet used to be for porn, I guess. Okay, number four, Book of Mormon. Josh Gad won a Tony for Book of Mormon. Josh Gad is a South Florida product, went to the same high school as my kids, had a chance to 
get to know him well in Florida and various other places. He is a talent. If you haven't checked out Central Park on Apple TV Plus, please do. If you haven't gone to see Book of Mormon, you'll know exactly which part he played and you'll know why he was so good. It was meant for him. Book of Mormon is about Mormons and it's a musical and it uses words like maggot. You're going to like it. The third best play I ever saw was Jeff Daniels in a play called To Kill a Mockingbird. To Kill a Mockingbird, the book, you may, you may have heard of it. You may have read it. And uh, the play with Jeff Daniels, which was just two years ago, maybe, seeing him and thinking, you were in Dumb and Dumber. You were in Speed. My God, you were in Newsroom, which I love. And now you are in To Kill a Mockingbird. You are talented. An incredible revival is the one I saw, and it was the third best play I've ever seen. The second best play was with Dustin Hoffman. I saw Death of a Salesman with Dustin Hoffman. If you have not read Death of a Salesman, you should. It is a very important story about who we are, what we do, and what defines us, and how it's hard for us to understand those who aren't like us, but we need to try. Death of a Salesman with Dustin Hoffman. And the number one Broadway show I've ever attended I know you asked this question, so here's the list, and here it is. And you know I quote it all the time. I talk about the room where it happens. I talk about Aaron Burr, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Lynn manuel Miranda, who is the single most talented playwright I have come across, done more for Latinos than anyone has on Broadway and still got criticized for his In the Heights movie, which is an outrage. But Hamilton is genius. Every single line, every single song, the choreography, get Disney Plus and watch Hamilton. I know that's a competition of Paramount Plus. Sorry, CBS. But get Disney Plus. If you don't want to get the bundle, don't. Watch Hamilton. You want to cancel after 30 days? Be my guest. Not my issue. But if you have never seen Hamilton, you don't need to read the thick book. But you're going to want to look at the lyrics. You can watch it on with closed captioning, but I want to thank Lin-Manuel Miranda and all the people who are creative, all the writers, the authors, the musicians, the singers, the people who make my life better than it would be were it to be in silence. Hamilton is the top Broadway show I've ever attended, and I got to see Lin-Manuel Miranda, and I remember tearing up, giving him a standing ovation, both when he took the stage, thanking him for taking the time to make, to make a difference, and then at the end, at the curtain call, hearing the standing ovation and the applause is a sound I will never forget. I appreciate when you ask me to go through these lists because I think about them, and then I get to tell you them. And if you see any plays or movies that we talked about, see Usual Suspects, watch Hamilton, and we will do this again. I appreciate you.